Good afternoon. Um, we're going to start our lecture. Uh, we have one of the speakers who's late, so we're going to start our lecture with Mr. Ba'al Gamal first, and then uh, he'll probably join us uh, uh, in the middle. So this lecture is part of the dimensions of social justice uh, and goes within the social justice and development policy uh, program at the Isan Faris Institute, which is a new program that just got launched with the Bob Center uh, at Princeton University. My name is Leila Kabalan, and I'm the program coordinator. Um, today's lecture is post-uprising economies and alternatives and the changing paradigm. Uh, our first speaker is Mr. Wael Gamal. Mr. Uh, Gamal is an Egyptian economic journalist, columnist, and researcher. He has more than 18 years of experience in journalism with local and international media, including CNBC, BBC Arabia, and Thomson Reuters. He contributed to the launch of Al Shuruq newspaper, which is a daily Egyptian newspaper in 2009 as its economic editor before becoming its manager, uh, managing editor at, in 2010. Uh, he has studied political science uh, in Cairo University and finance and investment in Middlesex University in London. Um, so please join me to welcome Mr. Rual Gamal, who's going to be our first speaker. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, Assam Fares Institute for inviting me. To it's always a pleasure to come to Beirut, um, uh, and on this very important issue, which is usually neglected in the discussions, political discussions and academic discussions, maybe lately, only lately, that uh, the social just justice issues are يعني, a little bit uh, uh, recognized uh, uh, after three years of uprisings. Um, and يعني, I would like to start by this uh, uh, trying to understand what happened, what really happened in the, in, uh, in the Arab world since uh, January 2011. And uh, because it was not really uh, uh, expected for uh, many people. And uh, I think that whoever didn't see the um, preload, the long uh, uh, persistent preload of uh, social protest before the years, five or six years before the, the, the explosion of uh, January, uh, was not in a uh, good position to see what happened in January. Uh, in Egypt, for example, we have, we have seen a surge in social protest and um, st uh, workers' strikes and people going to streets for maybe starting with uh, 2004, and it was not a coincidence at all that in 2004 we had the uh, clearest neoliberal government in the history of Egypt taking uh, power and trying and starting very aggressively to apply uh, what they thought was the best solution to Egypt's economy's uh, problems. And with the, with the acceleration of these policies, which we have seen in Egypt, since the 90s, the, the, the uh, opposition to it, to, to these policies also accelerated. And we have seen that, and what we have seen in, uh, uh, in the streets of Cairo in January we, was uh, uh, an experience of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Egyptians before the revolution. So it was not really uh, a total uh, uh, surprise at least for people who were this, يعني, studying the, the, the social movement and the social protest movement before that. But even after it happened, the interpretation of what happened was usually uh, uh, focusing on other elements. And, يعني, despite the fact that the Tunisian uprising began as a protest for the unemployed, at least for uh, seven days, the, it was a mere protest of the unemployed in the poorest areas of Tunisia. And then, even, even after that, the main force behind the, 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 the uprising or the revolution in Tunisia was the, uh, trade, the, big, the biggest trade union, workers' trade unions in, in Tunisia. And uh, in Egypt also, there was the very famous slogan of Aish Hurriya Adalak Tamaya, which two, two of the, the, the words of, يعني, two demands of the, of the slogan were about economics. Uh, but 
يعني academics and journalists alike, especially foreign ones, prefer to look to it as uh, as we were discussing before the lecture, uh, uh, a youth movement, a youth revolution in one uh, respect. The other, uh, some said it was some kind of uh, a new uh, technological, uh, social technological kind of revolution using Facebook and Twitter and that sort of thing. And of course, we, we have seen the, the classic uh, interpretation of uh, uh, democratic transition uh, uh, paradigm applied to Egypt and Tunisia and the whole area and the issue started to be rather than the, the, the structural problems which are not only political, it's economic also in their nature, uh, focusing on constitution, on uh, elections, what is best for Egypt or Tunisia, should we start first by um, uh, preparing a good constitution or we, should we start by an election and, and then it went to the, uh, the, uh, the very popular uh, Western uh, yani thing with the Islamic and uh, non-Islamic division of society and the political Islam and these issues. But the, <laughs> through the three years, uh, the uh, social protest didn't uh, go down. Uh, even, yani, after the uh, January, at least in Egypt, we found people establishing new independent trade unions everywhere in, uh, in Egypt, thousands of new uh, indicates. Also, people went to the streets several times. In September 2011, we have seen one of the biggest strike waves in the history of Egypt, with at least a quarter of a million participating, including medical doctors, uh, uh, post office workers, uh, public transport workers. And even at that point, it was ignored again. And in the year that of the rule of ruling of the Muslim Brotherhood was Morsi in power, we have seen at least the official figures announced by the presidency just before the, what happened uh, in uh, June, that there was, there was a, a at least 7,000 social protests in one, at least, I think, 10 months of uh, the ruling of Morsi. And of course, the president, um, yeah, the, the official um, interpretation was that it was an obstacle, a challenge to Morsi rather than the uh, manifestation of um, uh, a betrayal to the main demand to the, of, the, of the revolution. And I don't see what happened. It's, it, yani, it is clear to me wh why the focus on other issues rather than social justice, because it, yani, as a, I see what happened, it is, oh, of course, it's a political revolution. It is a political uprising because it, it was uh, against the, uh, uh, a regime that ruled Egypt and Tunisia and Libya for ages and against oppression, against torture, of course. But in, in deep down, it is against the, the whole system that political op, uh, oppression is only a part of, but also on the levels of economic oppression and, and neoliberal policies. And in this consideration, we cannot uh, see what happened um, uh, as some, some specific thing to the Arab world as some academics would like to see that here is the, uh, the last wave of democracy on the earth, or on that sort of thing. But it was clear just after what happened in Tahrir and Tunisia what in, that what happened in Spain, for example, the, the, the public um, protest that uh, we have seen in the squares of Spain, and then the Occupy movement, that it is not something specific to this area in particular, a cultural thing, uh, 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 related to the Arabs. It is something uh, uh, part of a, a world uh, movement against neoliberalism. And the political consequences of neoliberalism, and, uh, a Princeton study that was announced days ago would, would have uh, that severe judgment on the US uh, regime that it is no longer a democracy, even the US. So, uh, and this is, 
very related to the distribution of power that is giving much, much, much weight to the richer, the richest minority, the 1% of society. And it's the same case in, in we see in Egypt and we see in Tunisia and Libya and elsewhere. Um, so it is, it is a part of uh, a world wave and, and we cannot really, uh, we will not be in a good position to understand the future of what happened here unless, in my opinion, unless we uh, uh, put it in this context. Uh, one um, um, British journalist uh, worked for the BBC for a while, his name is Paul Mason, wrote a book about what happened in Egypt and, and Tunisia called Why It's kick Kicking Off Everywhere. And he called the, the reason behind what's going on as, um, I called it, uh, an error de systema, يعني خطأ في نظام التشغيل, error de systema. And this is the case. And now we have seen reactions all over the world discussing and, and rethinking the basic uh, rules of the economic system and the political uh, division of power in societies and the crisis of democracy. We even saw the IMF and the World Bank trying to introduce themselves uh, differently, uh, introducing concepts like inclusive growth, uh, trying to focus more on inequalities, uh, sustainable growth, which is uh, usually um, linked to uh, more uh, equal opportunities and that sort of thing. And we have seen also uh, uh, academics revisiting the, the, the uh, superiority of the markets over everything else that was introduced as, the, as if it was a, a magical solution to everything. And it, it is failing everywhere, not only in the Arab world. Maybe it is more obvious in the Arab world when you see uh, that sort of um, crony capitalism uh, regimes and very close uh, people, businessmen who are very close, very close to Mubarak regime or Ben Ali making billions of dollars. But it is happening, this trend is happening everywhere. And one of the, one of, I think you might have heard of the debate that was stirred by the new book of Thomas Piketty, the French researcher, uh, the book uh, Capital in the 21st Century, who based uh, his analysis of the relation between um, capitalism in general and inequality on a, uh, an empirical um, research to the relation between income distribution and wealth, wealth distribution and income that is coming from wealth for uh, at least uh, uh, 200 years in the developed world and the, in some developing uh, countries. And he had this uh, very strong conclusion that uh, uh, capitalism is uh, byproduct uh, uh, contradictory to uh, equality. Also, we have seen some uh, reactions to that from the uh, uh, beginning of the 80s with uh, the book of David Miller on, on social justice, which was acknowledging that the injustice uh, created by the system, uh, starting by the wave of uh, Reaganism and Thatcherism, and privatization and uh, opening all um, borders for um, uh, liberal, for transactions, capital movement and, and FDI and uh, trade that uh, usually uh, work for the benefit of big uh, corporations. And uh, for Miller, uh, Miller was very um, uh, focusing on the demands of the people against injustice. And he considered this as, as if social justice means what the people uh, need and want and uh, demand. And this is one approach to um, uh, explain and uh, for the definition of social justice, which is, I think it's obvious that it's not really, you cannot really find a scientific uh, agreed uh, definition for. It's a, a very normative uh, concept and open for interpretations. But this was a reaction to what was, what was happening in the international economy from even the beginning of the 80s. And then 
there was this school of uh, egalitarian liberals uh, uh, that was uh, started by John Rawls, and then there was Amartya Sen, the Indian uh, Nobel Prize winner, economist, and they also focused on injustice and inequalities that were created by the system. Uh, Rawls focused on uh, trying, creating a new social contract and trying to establish uh, uh, institutions that work on, on some sort of uh, uh, an ideal uh, uh, infrastructure for social justice. And Amartya Sen focused more on uh, the, the changes in inequalities and on the movement of the people to uh, acquire better um, access to uh, rights. And Amartya Sen also linked that to political freedom. And on, on all aspects, from all this, these perspectives, we can see that after um, mass movements like this in, uh, in the Arab world, nothing really happened concerning social justice. If you take it from the demands of the people that went to, to the streets, uh, in Egypt, we um, at least one of the minimum wage demand, it didn't really happen. Uh, maximum wage and minimum wage, uh, uh, reforming health uh, institutions and services, it didn't happen. Uh, retaining some balance into the taxation system, it didn't happen. The opposite happened. Uh, reforming subsidies, not slashing subsidies, but reforming subsidies until there is a social safety net to real, real social safety nets that can uh, support the poor who are were suffering and are suffering from the uh, economic difficulties that happened uh, uh, before and after the uh, uprisings. Nothing really happened. The, the, philosophy, the old philosophy is still working. And we have seen in Egypt um, in the previous uh, six months and before that with the Muslim Brotherhood that they were just taking the projects of Gamal Mubarak and his guys from the drawer and reproducing them as if the, uh, they were the, the optimal and the only solution for the economic uh, problems of Egypt. And now we, 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 were, we are told, even with a non-elected president and, and uh, uh, a government with no popular legitimacy, that they, they are starting already uh, applying the uh, the uh, old target of slashing subsidies for the poor and, uh, and applying the VAT, the value-added tax, which is an indirect tax. And we, we, we never hear that there is any intention, at least uh, now, that uh, to have to tax capital gains, to have uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions tax that was planned First, or at least uh, the government spoke of uh, in the beginning. And even when the people uh, went to court and had sentences that proved that some of the privatization transactions that were, were done before the revolution were corrupt, the government refused to, um, uh, to apply the, the, the court ruling and uh, refuse to take back the, the, the companies from the, the investors that have taken uh, state assets in, in corruption. And even now, there, um, we have uh, new um, legislations with, without the presence of the, uh, an elected parliament that makes more room for corruption in the state uh, apparatus and with the business community. One that uh, uh, spares the uh, giving uh, land for agriculture or tourism or industry from the bidding, uh, transparent uh, bidding uh, measures. And it's not bil amr al they call it just, it needs the minister to give the land to whoever investor without any real uh, supervision from the, the, the law. That, that, is, that was one. And even Mubarak didn't dare to do that. And then there was this new legislation two days ago that uh, only makes uh, the right to go to court on, on public uh, contracts only for investors who are 
part of the contract or may have um, uh, in competition with the investor who are in the contract and the state. So it would make someone like Khalid Ali, who's an Egyptian lawyer and was a president, presidential candidate, who went to court several times to and 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 uh, and won won the the verdict for uh, the, the minimum wage and and then in in the case of corruption in giving land to uh, in Madinti case uh, giving land to Talat Mustafa Company and then in Palm Hills and and all the, the these issues are not available now by legislation after after the revolution. Um, so if you take th this um, uh, consideration, what the people wanted, it, it is not happening. And not to speak of uh, institutional and uh, legislate, yeah, legislative uh, and regulative reg uh, regulations that are organizing the political economy of Egypt. It didn't happen at all, uh, as we have seen. Uh, Another thing is always, يعني, what is the alternative? This is the question raised all the time by the whoever is in power. And what, what I think is that whoever was ruling Egypt is still in power. Mubarak went and uh, was toppled, but the regime behind Mubarak was there all the time. And, and uh, the coalition, يعني, usually Mubarak regime is taken as Mubarak regime, but in fact, it is not as personalized as that. Uh, Mubarak was representing the interests of a coalition, a ruling coalition, a new ruling coalition, uh, contain, including uh, the, arm, the military, including the uh, bureaucratic uh, apparatus, and the newcomer that uh, came in in the 90s and afterwards, which is the business elite. And in fact, in my opinion, for example, the, the succession uh, uh, program to get Gamal Mubarak in power was not uh, a project to get Gamal Mubarak in power and then looking for someone to support it. It was the opposite. This business elite saw in Gamal Mubarak the best represent representative of their interests. And one time after one time, we have seen this, these demands coming from the street, from the squares of Egypt, of social justice, and we have seen this coalition between the bureaucratic state and the military and the business elite blocking every single demand. Um, I was talking to Laila before, before the lecture, Lucy, uh, about the, the first draft budget after the revolution that was prepared by Samir Adwan, who was then the finance minister of Egypt. And it was, by then we were against it. We saw that it was not much to do. It was less, less, less uh, than we expect to happen after a mass movement like that. But at least the, the, the rationale of the budget, uh, the public bu budget was not the, the traditional classic IMF new liberal thing of uh, decreasing uh, budget deficit and uh, controlling the financial of the state, which is a problem, of course, but also to create jobs. Uh, and by, because of that, Amir Radwan tried to, have, to get some balance into the taxation system, which is totally against the poor in Egypt, and introduce uh, uh, taxes on, on the stock market, uh, raise the, um, change the taxation system from the flat tax rate of 20% to a more progressive taxation system, and so on. And all these reforms nearly was, were blocked by this coalition uh, of interests. And uh, I recall one interview we have did in Shuruk with Samir Adwan, and he was clearly saying that the uh, uh, brokers of the stock market stopped it. And the, after the first draft were refused, was refused by the SCAF, it returned against, again to the austerity kind of budget with a budget deficit target of 8%. And all these tax, new taxes were cancelled, and we returned to the uh, prospect of uh, uh, introducing new, new indirect taxation on the poor. 
and, and to get back to the alternative thing, uh, this, is, this coalition is always uh, uh, making this point, there's no alternative. This is the only way to solve uh, the public finance problem of Egypt. This is the only way to deal with, uh, the only way to deal with, uh, with the uh, poor growth conditions in Egypt, economic growth, is to attract FDI and to make all effort to, um, uh, to guarantee the exit uh, strategies for uh, big, uh, big companies so that they come, because uh, else you know, they will not come in the first place and will not pump FDI in the country and, and this kind of thing. But in fact, alternatives to these policies were introduced everywhere. In, 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 um, you know, I noticed that the, the most advanced on producing the alternatives to the um, uh, ruling economic uh, uh, narrative came from new political parties and in the programs of presidential candidates in the uh, elections of 2012. And uh, the, يعني, the contradiction is that the, the, the two candidates that went to the second round were the, the the most neoliberal of them, uh, Mohamed Morsi and Ahmed Shafi. But in, in fact, at least uh, Abdel Manam of Futuh, uh, Khalid Ali, Hamdi Sabahi, and even Amr Musa introduced alternative, tried to introduce alternative policies to the um, neoliberal uh, narrative. And the other, the other uh, يعني, section that tried to introduce alternatives were, were the protesters and social movements themselves. And uh, I will get back to that later. But on the academic uh, uh, level and on the policy level, we didn't see that at all. Uh, as I said, on the policy level, we have seen um, officials, the same ones, technical uh, experts and, and, and officials that work, the bureaucrats that worked for um, uh, Mubarak regime, they themselves, with the same kind of mentality, with the same kind of ideas, doing the, the preparing budgets and negotiating with the IMF and doing and taking decisions on the um, on the economic policies of Egypt. Uh, and academics still focus on the financial aspects of the crisis, economic crisis in Egypt, as if the economy is only about the um, uh, international reserves and uh, the. Uh, uh, Morgan Stanley's uh, uh, evaluation of the Egyptian banking system and that kind of thing, and ignoring uh, the, the creating real economic uh, activity on the ground and creating jobs as a booster of economic activity. Um, I will end by referring to one of the major Yani for the social protests we have seen in, in the previous three years, the medical doctors had their own plan of re restructuring spending on health, for example. And they produced this plan and discussed it with every single minister of health that came to Egyptian government since then, but nothing happened. Uh, even the workers of the uh, public transport, they had their own alternative plan of organizing how the public transport service can be organized. And, and for the medical doctors, they, they didn't only focus on their wages. They, all, yani, they also have raised demands concerning the quality of the service and the way the, the health sector is organized in Egypt. And there is this one example of the, uh, I've, wrote, I've written about, which uh, is a company that was established in the 70s to produce seeds for agriculture. It's called Noba Seed. And uh, this country, this uh, company, uh, summarizes what happened in the economic uh, policies of Egypt. Because uh, firstly, it was uh, one of the, uh, the companies that uh, participated in the normalization with Israel and, and, and agriculture. And then afterwards, the, the, and it used to produce 60% of the whole production of seeds in Egypt. And then it was privatized. It was sold to uh, a Saudi uh, investor. 
and the Saudi investor changed the, the main activity of the company towards a more uh, international uh, demand, uh, uh, yani, focusing on international demand, not, not producing seeds for agriculture of Egypt, and then uh, produ uh, focusing on uh, straw strawberry and that kind of uh, agricultural product that is focusing on the needs of the international economy and exporting uh, agricultural products. And then the, the guy who uh, took the company all also took land which was not owned by the company as a byproduct of the transaction. After the revolution, the uh, workers of the company went to uh, court and uh, uh, the state, the government by then, saw that there were unlawful practices and that uh, the transaction was not uh, legal and uh, tried to take back the company. And then when uh, Hazem Beblawi government came to power, they returned the company to the investor who decided to close the company. And the workers refused that. And they had their own version of running the company themselves and making profits out of it. Uh, and returning to the old role of the company, which is uh, focusing, concentrating on the production of seeds for the peasants and farmers of Egypt, and not only focusing on the needs of uh, exporting uh, to the ent international economy. And this one example of how workers and simple people in Egypt produce economic al alternatives that are not really theoretical ones, they enforce it uh, in, and, and it works in, in reality. And in my opinion, this is the gate to creating a totally different system that works for the uh, benefit of the people and for social justice as it should be. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to open the floor up for questions. Uh, and if I may, because I'm the moderator, I will use the dictatorship. Uh, I'm going to ask you, so, so you conclude by saying that it's really this, the anecdote that you said that this is the way to produce economic alternatives. But why do you see that this uh, really economic alternatives are not resonating with the people as much as neoliberal policies are? So why do you why do you think neoliberal policies are still capable of being of forcing themselves to be the only alternative when clearly they have failed and they they are continually capable to recycle themselves? Uh, and produce themselves as if they're new alternatives when they're really not. What gives them this momentum? I, I think it's political power. Uh, yeah, for example, yeah, this, this is one example I, I always speak of. Uh, Ahmed Aiz, who was very close, was one of the leaders of the NDP and one big businessman in Egypt who were, was accused of monopoly of the steel sector. And he was in jail because of the, the deals his company uh, did, while his company continued to be uh, monopolizing the, st the, state, uh, the steel sector in Egypt and making more profits than it used to be before the revolution. And when, when you have in mind that you will get a government that is trying to really fix this situation, it will not work as yani, uh, piece by piece because he, the, this company, if they want to um, create a huge problem for the economy, they can stop production for six months, and then the prices of steel will go to the sky, and then they will, will put pressure on, on the, whoever is in charge. And when you know that these people coordinate with, yani, uh, together, uh, at least, well, Maybe you heard of the coal, um, uh, the issue in Egypt to import coal instead of uh, natural gas and, and for industries, especially in the cement sector. This is exactly 
a manifestation of, of the monopoly over politics by big business, which is, this is, يعني, instead of restructuring the cement sector, which takes, which is subsidized by the government in land and in energy, and they sell, and after that they have a monopoly over, over prices, so they sell in the internal market, in the local market, uh, with prices higher than the international market. And instead of restructuring this, and, and this, is, this is a sector that is nearly 85% owned by foreign companies, even not uh, Egyptian companies. And they can uh, control the uh, economic policy of the government, which, of course, we have seen an opposition to importing coal from, from abroad. And at the same point, at the same point of time, the same uh, Prime Minister, Ibrahim Mahlib, when he met the workers of the uh, Elwan steel factory, the famous one, which has um, five per, uh, 50 percent uh, capacity of the factory is not working because of uh, they have no coal. And he, his, his, his uh, answer was the, to them that the Egyptian economy cannot really sustain to buy coal from abroad or the steel factory in Helwan, but he, the Egyptian economy can do that for the cement uh, sector. But what I meant was, yani, going back to your question, what I meant was not that the only uh, yani, source of new economic alternative will come from the movement, but the, whatever solution, whatever alternative you will get, uh, you will need political power to support it and to enforce it. And that, that's the important thing about the... Uh, you will find academics, you will find NGOs in Egypt trying to produce and think of alternatives, but it will not work and it will not have the stamina and support to be a real alternative on the agenda without a social movement from below. Yes. <laughs> uh, you can stay there if you want. <laughs> Do we have questions? Hi, my name is Monica Alcott. Um, I was wondering to what extent this question of political power is not also on, uh, ultimately linked to the question of ownership. What appears from what you're saying is the way in which or why the state so easily lends itself to be hijacked and incorporated or used by neoliberal policies is that it has this exclusive right to determine the distribution of collectively held resources. And the, the example you're giving of the seed company is highly interesting in, in people taking back ownership of the company. And here I was interested, did this exceed? Is the company owned by the people now? And how much room there is in other domains, land, energy, resources, in the Constitution or in other legislations, for people to kind of extend this claim of ownership of the country in opposition to the state as, as, a, as a basis for this politi political power to become effective as a, as a collective power? Uh, at least for the Nubasid case, uh, uh, they, they, they are in court still. But they're, what they're doing is not legal because this company is owned by the Saudi uh, investor till now. And there was some um, uh, other examples of uh, management by the workers in, in some other sectors and demands to do that. But it's not a big wave as, for example, what happened in Argentina yet. Uh, we didn't see this yet, and it's not legal. I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think the constitution, uh, the new constitution of Egypt, uh, gives right to uh, self-management. Uh, it speaks of um, cooperatives, but in, uh, cooperatives in Egypt are still controlled by the state after what Nasser did to them. Uh, uh, it's not a real... It, it doesn't really, um, uh, it's not really coming as a democratic manifestation of ownership as it should be. Uh, 
uh, but but what you said that the state have the, the capacity to distribute wealth like that it was the case not only in Egypt it was the case for all privatization uh, uh, operations all over the, the world that you are redistribute, redistributing the um, uh, wealth of society in land and uh, natural resources and giving, giving them for accumulation for the purpose of accumulation to big companies and even for small businessmen to create big uh, entities and it happened very very fast in Egypt uh, the examples I spoke of uh, one of the examples I spoke of is Palm Hills, which is um, uh, one of the real estate uh, big companies in Egypt, was one, uh, one example of that because this company didn't exist uh, before 2005 and uh, the, the, the head of the company was the cousin, the brother of the Minister of Housing and the um, cousin of the Minister of Transport of Egypt. Uh, and when they came to power in the Nazif government, the, uh, they established, he established a new uh, company and then began buying land from the state. He started by 100,000 uh, square meters in 2005. By 2008, the company owned 50 million square meters. And, uh, with, uh, and they, they even didn't pay the whole sum of money, which was 7 billion pounds. That this was the numbers even announced by the company when they tried to list in uh, London Stock Exchange. And they, by 2008, the land bank of the company was evaluated when they listed their shares in, in London, uh, uh, was evaluated as a net worth of uh, 48 billion pounds. And they, they um, I recall correctly, they only paid 2.7 2 billion pounds from the 7 billion pounds they originally had the contract for. And you can see how they became a, a, a very big company in three years just by having this close relation to the, the state. I think I'm going to move to the next speaker and then we'll continue. Um, so we have Mr. Ziad Abdesamad. He's the executive director of ANND, the Arab NGO Network for Development, which, bring to, which brings together 30 NGOs and nine national networks from 12 Arab countries and is active in the protection of social and economic rights. Mr. Abdus Samad is the co-founder and president of the Euro-Mediterranean NGO platform, which brings together 82 national government, national NGOs um, uh, that, that work on national, regional, and thematic uh, uh, platforms mainly in the Mediterranean area, uh, to monitor the EU neighborhood uh, policy. He's active in many global and regional networks working on democracy and elections, economic and social policies, as well as the role of the in international and intergovernmental agencies. He's going to be talking uh, more uh, about the IMF policies. Under <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> For being late, I don't know why, for some stupid reasons, I thought that it should be at 3 o'clock and I was sitting in the office. <laughs> so I'm sorry, uh, and by the way, it's not my habit to, to, to arrive. Uh, 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 I, uh, talking about the post-uprising economies and the alternative, um, uh, I would like to focus more on the role of the international financial institutions and mainly particularly focusing on the IMF. I don't know uh, what uh, Wael spoke about, but I think that Wael is one of the uh, most uh, prominent uh, writers in economies and he's following closely uh, the role of the IMF and mainly in Egypt and he's writing a weekly uh, article about these issues and we are all taking our information from uh, partially from what he's uh, saying, so I feel also uncomfortable <laughs> to talk about that. <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, my, uh, my, my, I, I will start by saying that uh, the failure uh, is that there is no chance for stability uh, or any success of democratic practices without uh, putting in place a system of economic justice, and thus 
there is a need of addressing the implemented economic models. And this is, I mean, uh, my, my starting point. And focusing on the IMF, I wanted to say that uh, uh, a little bit of uh, what the IMF was trying to do with our, uh, in our countries, uh, in our region, uh, before the appraisings, and then the role of the IMF uh, after the appraisings, and most recently the IMF issued many documents uh, that I will like, I would like to go through uh, with you and maybe uh, uh, to discuss a little bit. But first, let's say that the main role of the IMF, uh, and the IMF was assigned to regulate the financial system and to, 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 to secure uh, financial stability worldwide, at the global level, including in, uh, in our region. As the IMF helped the Arab countries to implement the structural adjustment policies or programs, uh, which make them eligible, yani it was a precondition to make the Arab countries eligible to its loans or to the loans of the other international institutions, including the World Bank and many other actors. The main objective of the structural adjustment policies and it was to reduce budget deficit, which means from their perspective to create kind of a financial stability. So the main asks were to cut budget spend. Maybe these are things that you know, but it is important to remind us that cutting government spending, privatizing the state-owned uh, enterprises or institutions, adopting free trade, and liberalizing the interest rate and exchange rates. These are the main or the pillars of the structural adjustment policies. And during the two or three decades before the appraisings, the major trend was to follow these uh, policies um, that we can call austerity policies. And in response to these policies, reducing the weight of the state, in response to these policies, the government were obliged to increase taxes and mainly the tax on consumption, VAT. Not the direct tax on income, because this can affect uh, investment, and it will not create the enabling environment for the investment. So the alternative was to focus on the VAT, devaluate national currencies, reduce subsidies, transfer, and then uh, this, will ha this had kind of inflationary effect and price hike, and this impacted directly the living conditions of the citizens. And that's how, in, in, in our region, when we are talking about the region, we know that we have a lot of different, we don't have the same countries, we don't have the same level of development or of wealth. We have LDCs, least developed countries, medium income countries, we have the GCCs, but still the same uh, bottom line or the common uh, uh, line was that uh, the, the leading process was to regress in the productive capacities and decline of the industrial capacities and agriculture mainly. So this was associated with uh, economic growth that we achieved. And somehow 5 to 7% yearly economic growth. But this also was paralleled with kind of a decline in job opportunity and a depreciation of wages as a percentage from the uh, national income. And this underpinned the lack of justice and the citizens were marginalized and not part of the So lack of justice. And I think that the appraisings will never succeed unless they address the lack of justice. And it's not only about governance and, part and, and political participation. It's very important, which is a priority as well, but justice. And if we, if we follow the, the uh, developments in Egypt and in Tunisia, we see that mostly the investment, because we, we, we uh, we impose kind of uh, taxes on consumption in order to attract investments. But the investments, uh, by the way, uh, the Arab region was not 
uh, very high in attracting investments if we compare to other regions and to other world. But still, the investments in Arab region were in sectors with low job generation first, and, and then uh, uh, they, are, they were mainly focused or uh, mainly in uh, sectors like the finance and real estate. Moreover, the development projects and social policies were marginalized in the national policies, and generally, they were perceived as to be like a trickle-down effect from the economic growth. Thus, the economic policies were mainly towards trade liberalization and growth. And Egypt allocated, yani, mostly in Egypt, it was 25% of, uh, of the income uh, to debt servicing which means that there is a big shift from the allocation of the national fund to pay the debt servicing instead of uh, uh, investing in other social or other uh, capacity, uh, productive uh, investments. So this is, uh, I mean, uh, the image uh, before the appraisings. Let's say that the IMF interventions as I mentioned earlier, had as a main objective the stabilization of the economies. So stabilization, from our perspective, should not be targeting only the stabilization of the balance of payment or the inflation or budget deficit, but stabilization should be the stabilization of the real economic productive capacities. In other words, stabilization should be for the productive capacities and job creation and focusing on the productive sectors with value added and able to compete and they increase employability such as industrialization, agriculture, services. But the, the reality is not in this direction. The interventions of IMF or the international institu institutions in general are currently designed uh, to threaten, I mean, not intentionally maybe, the side effect is to shrink, to limit the policy space of the government, which means that the governments cannot decide on policy tools like microeconomic policies, fiscal, etc., in order to address the national, the national challenges. Let me say that now, we are witnessing a, a huge or an important change in the IMF discourse, or at least uh, documents. I mean, uh, lately, with Mrs. Lagarde, Christine Lagarde, the executive director of the, of the IMF, in her interviews and in the, uh, in, the, in the opening speech of the spring meeting of the International Financial Institute, as well as in kind of a, an interview with Mr. Mas'ud Muhammad, Mr. Mas'ud Ahmad, who is the head of the MENA region in the IMF, they are talking, they, they are, there is kind of a shift in the, in the discourse. Moreover, a paper issued in February, last February, by the IMF, uh, entitled, the paper uh, entitled, The Redistribution, Inequality and Growth, where they recognize that there are uh, a lot of problems in the previous IMF approach where they recognize that inequality is the main challenge that societies are facing and that it is not only about poverty. When you are talking about inequality means that you have to address inequality by adopting policies for redistribution. So they talk about redistribution as response to the inequalities, including adopting tax policies, income tax policies, with uh, a tendency to make kind of a balance between income tax and the uh, enabling environment for the investors. So we can always create a balance between two, the, uh, these two. So this is uh, the paper, and most lately, it was launched in last, last two weeks ago, the New Horizons 
towards the new horizons and economic transformation amid political transition in the region. So this is the new, let's say, IMF uh, vision or their policies in, uh, in our region where they are, let's say, uh, this is creating kind of a, a platform for further discussions about, about these policies. Like comparing to the paper, because the IMF, just after the appraising, they issued a paper in 2011 where uh, they were uh, attempting to take into consideration issues and reasons of the, of the revolutions in, in Egypt and, uh, and, and Tunisia, despite the progress in macroeconomy that they predicted before the revolutions and mainly uh, measuring the economic growth and the good, let's say, performance done by the Egyptian and Tunisian governments. So, uh, in, in, in their paper in 2011, they were presenting the same old recommendation under new, uh, new, new umbrellas, but the problem was that the main focus or the main reason of the uh, uh, revolutions was perceived to be the lack of governance. I mean, and thus, if we address the problem of governance, this will have a trickle-down effect on, on the other uh, issues and mainly on justice uh, and uh, so, uh, in this new uh, new paper, they have three main uh, objectives. The first one is to enable the additional job creation, create job by adopting new policies, addressing macroeconomic vulnerability, including inequalities and uh, productive capacities, or reform uh, in order to generate higher uh, growth. To a certain extent, I mean, these can be perceived to be uh, a positive uh, change in, uh, in, the, in the vision or perception of the international financial, mainly in the IMF. But the problem uh, will persist in the policy design, which will be always the gray area. How we interpret, how we, uh, let's say, uh, transform these principles into uh, uh, politics or policies. So these objectives, in light of the previous experience, including regress in productive capacity in manufacturing, investing in low added value services, increase of poverty and unemployment, so we see lapses. In time where we saw economic growth, we didn't see improvement in the social challenges, but we witnessed the pressure of wages, of the percentage of the income Besides, now the challenge is how to address these challenges. So I will uh, try to uh, focus on two main, two main issues, two main topics that I feel, I believe, that they are the main challenges and where the international financial institutions are playing a very important role in shaping the policies in these sectors and we need to see how we can improve. So the first one is trade-related recommendations. The paper suggests promoting further trade. The trade, trade is a very important factor, by the way, and sector for any macroeconomic policy. So they suggested promoting further trade and export-led growth, enhancing participation in value-added chain, to enhance integration in global trade, including with the EU and the US, by removing tariffs and non-tariff barriers, yani it's the same traditional say, receipt. And address, and this is the core issue, and address the labor market issues and regional integration. So, uh, all in all, the need for reform to address the business and investment climate, addressing labor market flexibility and to promote expert labor. Labor market flexibility. In light of the lessons learned, Arab countries have undertaken significant liberalization, but it didn't uh, take place in line with the supplies and demand, so it did not allow the Arab countries to expand their internal and regional market, which ended up to work in contradiction with the yani the, need, the need to balance the reliance on external market and building the domestic market and improving domestic consumption 
This comes in contradiction with the wages policy suggested in the paper. Flexibility of the market. And they suggest a decrease of the wages bill. It's known that the public sector is the main employer in the region. Although we are convinced that this needs to be reformed and this is not bill, but this, yani the, 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 the decrease in the wages bill should be with a longer term perspective and not an immediate. Yani it should be with kind of reforming the, the whole administration, but not take any kind of uh, immediate decision. Recommending decrease in the wages bill contradict the objective to increase the consumption capabilities and thus expanding the domestic market and also the recommendation for more flexibility in the labor market will also lead to the depression of wages in the private sector. And it's not only about the public sector, but it will lead also to the depression of the, of the wages in the public sector. This boost, uh, thus boosting consumption would not be addressed properly by these recommendations. The other point is to increase trade integration. The regional integration has been a long discussion uh, among the, how, how we can. Uh, the paper lies and focuses mainly on the non-tariff and tariff barriers. So dismantling the non-tariff and tariff barriers and the movement of with the knowledge and capacity of the labor market. These are needed, but the problem is that barriers hasn't been the problem of liberalization but of the inability to build complementarity in terms of productivity. So the recommendation for further liberalization as a main objective is distorting because the Arab countries can't benefit from the size of the regional market and they don't have the share from the global value chain. And you know that we are not in the core of the global value chain. We are at the periphery. When the paper addresses regional integration, they don't look at the sequence between the regional integration and the openness to the global market, and mainly to the, mar to the EU market. We are already open to the EU market, by the way, through these association agreement and free trade. But we see that we still have certain spaces. For example, service sector, that we are starting the negotiation with the EU that liberalization of the service. And it is not open yet. Currently, there is negotiations among the Arab countries. Thus, we can do the sequence, at least, between the opening of these sectors, between the Arab countries, before opening these sectors or this market to the EU or to the other uh, global partners. And this should be tackled. This issue should be tackled also by these. So the lack of sequencing uh, uh, can create a lot of challenges emerging from the attempt to push liberalization with the EU or others, which can hinder the opportunities uh, in front of the Arab. Arab. So at least, let's say, I took these two examples to say that the new horizon or the new shift in the IMF policies and vision, although it is still in the discourse and we didn't see any effect on the policies on the ground, Taking only two examples, like I, I mentioned, they are contradicting the, let's say, the, the positive discourse that we are hearing from the IMF leaders. Let me end by saying a few recommendations, if you, if you allow me, uh, for the Arab region and uh, for the alternative and the changing paradigm. First, I believe that we have to adopt a participatory and a rights-based model based on the review of the role of the state. Instead of shrinking the role of the state, we need to review the role of the state. Maybe shrink, maybe enlarge, maybe increase. But as a primary protector and guarantor of the citizens' rights and uh, economic approaches uh, that should be balanced and aimed, you know, the main objective should be sustainable development rather than economic growth. And return to developing uh, productive capacities uh, that create sustainable jobs. The second, to go beyond short-term fiscal consolidation towards supporting kind of a home-ground long-term vision for strengthening productive economies 
and economic sectors and empowering local economically in our uh, locals economically uh, in order to achieve greater social economic and political inclusivity to reform the tax policies and the tax policies should not be only perceived to be kind of a tool to increase the public income or, but there are tools for fair redistribution of wealth among the society and mainly addressing inequalities and investment approaches in support of productive sectors. I mean. Then to refrain from recommending major subsidy reform, and this is the main and the core problem that Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco are facing nowadays, in times of economic crisis and political upheaval. The fund should place greater priority on safeguarding the social and economic rights of citizens in the Arab region during period of unrest. But to, to review the global governments, which is a big problem, and economic structures toward more transparency and accountability, allowing better participation and engagement of the developing countries, at the same time allowing them with the necessary policy space for more relevant and adequate decision making uh, decision and policy making. Thank you. Questions? Do I need it or no? Thank you both uh, for this enlightening uh, discussion and talk uh, about economic issues which sometimes everybody has a hard time grappling with uh, because it is more complex. Uh, in, in this case, in terms of your presentations, uh, I, I do have you know some serious questions about uh, where have we gotten with some of the ideas that you've presented uh, around alternatives focusing on sustainable growth, uh, not uh, uh, just poverty, focusing on inequality and uh, all these very progressive and I, I think uh, good issues. Uh, when we look at uh, the whole process as far as the uprisings and uh, using those criteria of uh, working on job growth, uh, uh, trying to minimize inequality, where do we see social justice is in a place like Tunisia where the process has moved along politically maybe further than Egypt? Uh, and th that's a question to, to both of you. Has social, you know, the issue of social justice been advanced uh, in, in uh, Tunisia? And we know Tunisia was uh, one of these models for the IMF before the uprisings and all these issues. And then going back to maybe looking at the shortfalls of the mechanisms, the political and social mechanisms to change things in, uh, in Egypt. And in this case, ask Wael to respond to the comparative uh, situations in, uh, in Egypt and, and Tunisia, specifically around economic issues. I, uh, actually, it's a, it's a challenge. As I mentioned, uh, it's one of the flows that we focus on the political transformation without taking uh, care of the need to address the economic and social uh, transition as well, and properly. And this is the debate, the discussion between our partners, the IMF and the EU and everybody. The problem was not only in governance, the problem was in the models. So we need to address the models. This is one. So, uh, and, uh, and this is a, a common responsibility. I mean, if you need kind of uh, stability, it's not only political. It's also related to the economic and social. So the partners should take into consideration the IMF, the EU, etc., to help, to support any kind of transition, including the social economy. I can uh, uh, look. I'm, uh, I was uh, last month in, uh, in Uruguay where I had to check the chance to participate in a workshop where three ministers
took part. And you know that Uruguay is uh, one of the Latin American countries which was shifting. I mean, they, they did a big move from dictatorship to democracy. And even now, the president was one of the leaders of the opposition, Topamaros, with armed opposition. And he came from the jail to be the president. And the three ministers were also working underground. And now, Uruguay, in the political transition, they did a very important development at the economic and social level. And they are showing very good uh, indicators in terms of equality, job creation, uh, redistribution, etc. The conclusion is that they focused, when they come to the power, to the office, they focused on four core issues. And, and they imposed, I mean, they negotiated hardly with the IMF and with the other institutions, but they were stubborn enough in order to impose their priorities. The first one was focusing on the productivity, how to increase the productivity and to focus and to invest in the productive sectors with value added. Productive sectors that they can create jobs, but productive sector that they enhance the productivity. This was the first challenge. The second challenge was the redistribution and to restructure the tax system. Redistribution, by the way, should not only be perceived by the tax. Redistribution is tax, is services, and redistribution is wages as well. A policy of wages, a national policy of wages to increase and to enhance consumption uh, capacities. The third point was to have at least sovereignty on the national resources, to be able to mobilize domestic national resources in order to, let's say, uh, recreate wealth and redistribute wealth, or at least to. And the fourth, and this is the most important that we are still neglecting in our region, to adopt social policies. Because the social dimension is not the trickle-down effect of the economy. It should be addressed. And then social policy should not be kind of a program-oriented policy targeting the poorest, etc. Because these are programs for NGOs and civil society. When you are talking about a national policy, a public policy, you should talk about a comprehensive, universal social policy addressing the whole society and then social protection policy. So these are the four pillars that we need to address and these are the four pillars that our partners should also understand that these are priorities and they have to help us in order to implement them. So it's, uh, I mean, unless we in Tunisia or in Egypt, the decision makers, understand that these are the priorities and they have to address them properly and we have to have our strategic directions and negotiate accordingly, this will be very hard to reach any kind of uh, sustainable growth or social justice. Uh, yeah, one thing is the, it's not only about the, the look for, uh, search for alternative economic policies, not all, only about justice as a value or uh, that there are pe poor people that are suffering. This kind of uh, moral yani, thing. It is now much more than that because the, 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 the system is failing. Uh, one of the things, even the, the approach of the IMF, is not coming from uh, a moral thing, yeah, moral uh, uh, background. It, it is coming from the, 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 the need for a sustainable, uh, stable system. And that's why they're, they're trying to produce yani, different. Uh, Discourse like uh, Ziad, uh, like what Ziad spoke of, but even within the business community uh, of Egypt, at least, we have seen people coming from uh, the business community that, that who are defending a, a totally different approach from the, the, the ruling uh, elite now or the government from the yeah, from the same coming from the same area, uh, stabilizing the economy and understanding the, 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 the real meaning of what happened in January and afterwards. I, 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 I'm, 
specifically talking about someone like Hassan Hekel, who was uh, the head of one of the biggest investment banks in Egypt, even in the financial sector. This, this one investment bank was the one who were يعني, closely managing uh, Gamal Mubarak, some of Gamal Mubarak's investments. But from the first instance, he wrote about what he called Tahrir uh, tax, that the, the wealthy should try to give some concessions so that the, the, the system could continue. Uh, and, and lately I, I, wrote, uh, yeah, I read an article in Al Hayah for uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who is very close also to the ruling yeah, elite in Saudi Arabia, speaking nearly the same language, that inequalities in Saudi Arabia is growing very fast and this is, that this is a severe issue and, and uh, the, the, that the system should deal with that before things explode. So there are some voices coming from, not on the basis of the rights of the people or real democracy, but also from the grounds of maintaining the stability of the, of the system also. And one of the, the, the things behind the debate, the international debate of the economic system and how democratic it is, is not coming, it is coming from failure, from the, what happened in 2007, 2008, the uh, international financial crisis and, and the consequences of that and on the real uh, effects on that, of that on the real economy that are still with us since then. Uh, comparing Tunisia to Egypt, I'm not really يعني, into the details of what's going on in Tunisia, but يعني, one remark يعني, could be not uh, fine here, but as Tunisia, as you said, they have a step uh, ahead of us on, on the uh, political transformation process, but they, they also signed an agreement with the IMF, we didn't yet. Uh, and I, I think this is the same thing, they are going on the same road. In Egypt we didn't sign the agreement, but the new government we have in place now <coughs> really enforcing the agreement without really signing it. It is happening, the restructuring subsidies, energy subsidy, subsidies is happening in Egypt. Now, uh, natural gas, the is the uh, uh, price of natural gas and they are going to raise uh, gasoline and it's happened in Egypt already. I'm not, I'm not sure but my, my impression is that nothing really happened in Tunisia like Egypt <coughs> despite the fact that in Tunisia trade unions were more organized, had a um, yeah, uh, clearer rule in, in the toppling of Ben Ali and uh, even they had this uh, uh, older movement of to drop the international uh, audience debt before the campaign in Egypt was launched and they even managed to get into the parliament to convince some parties to adopt uh, uh, a debt condition. Uh, debt, uh, uh, but I don't think in, in, in general we, there's um, yeah, a great difference between the Egyptian and the Greek. Do we have any more questions? Comments? Okay, so please join me to thank Mr. Ziad al Samad and Mr. Wa'al Gamal, and thanks to Bayan and Nur and Lucy for helping us in our